there shall be signs in the sun, and in the moon, and in the stars, and upon the earth to stress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear, and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. One man, one microphone, one mission, one message. True News, the only newscast reporting the countdown to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And now for the most powerful hour on radio, here is End Time Newsman, Rick Wiles. This is True News. We report the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help us God. Welcome to the program. I'm Rick Wiles. One hour of uncensored news, views, and commentary. The U.S. Federal Reserve will continue printing money. That was the message this morning in Washington from the woman tapped by Mr. O to be the next chairperson of the central bank. Janet Yellen told the Senate Banking Committee today that she will carry on Ben Bernanke's policy of unprecedented financial stimulus until she sees improvement in the U.S. economy. Mrs. Yellen said only a strong economy will enable the Fed to reduce what she called monetary accommodation and reliance on unconventional policy tools. That's another way of saying, we ain't never done anything like this, ever in history. It's an unconventional policy tool. Um, Some financial analysts interpreted her remarks as a sign that she will accelerate and expand Mr. Bernanke's money printing scheme. Presently, the Federal Reserve is purchasing $85 billion each month of U.S. Treasury bonds to finance the U.S. debt. That, my friend, is financial incest. The central bank buying the debt of the U.S. government, of which it is the central bank. That is financial incest. And it is a recipe for financial collapse. But we're not going to talk about reality here today. Uh, Wall Street investors were happy, happy, happy today after hearing that the Fed printing presses will continue cranking out funny money. But over in Moscow, they're not laughing. A Russian lawmaker introduced a bill in the Duma that would ban the use or possession of the U.S. dollar in Russia. The member of the parliament, Mikhail Dekarov, compared the U.S. dollar to a Ponzi scheme. He warned that the Russian government will be forced to bail out Russian citizens and companies holding U.S. dollars if the American currency collapses. And he predicted that the U.S. dollar will collapse in the year 2017 as America's debt soars. Mining.com, that's a website that tracks, uh, reports the news of the mining industry around the world. It's a very reputable uh, website. They reported that China's central bank may have secretly purchased another 300 tons of gold in 2013. Now, China officially says its gold reserves are at 1,054 tons. But rumors have persisted throughout this year that the uh, Chinese may have purchased 6,000 tons of physical gold this year. Any guess what the Chinese are preparing for? Yeah, whoever has the biggest pile of gold will rule the world when the U.S. dollar collapses. Secretary of State John Kerry warned Congress not to hinder Mr. O's hand in ongoing negotiations in Geneva with the Iranians. Congressional supporters of Israel are pushing for a new round of crippling economic sanctions on the Islamic Republic to stop the country from assembling an arsenal of nuclear weapons. Now, 
Mr. Kerry said any effort in Washington to impose new sanctions would shatter the international coalition that has been negotiating with Iran. The, the coalition is already shattered, Mr. Kerry. You're a bumbling fool. I mean, you've made a mess of everything, Mr. Kerry. I mean, it, there is no coalition. Vice President Joe Biden is also working the phones on Capitol Hill, uh, warning congressmen not to um, oppose Mr. Obama on this uh, negotiation with Iran. Congressman Ed Royce, however, said that the Iranians have, uh, since they have not paused their nuclear program, the U.S. should not pause its economic sanctions. That sounds reasonable, doesn't it? Uh, Mr. Obama said today that he hopes Congress holds off on voting for new sanctions. He said that no matter how powerful the American military is, a strike against Iran's nuclear facility would only make Iran more determined to get nukes. He said military stuff is always messy. And he said, besides, six months from now, if the Iranians uh, are not serious, then he said, I'll just crank up those sanctions again. Illinois Republican Senator Mark Kirk denounced uh, the Obama administration as uh, similar to Britain's Neville Chamberlain, who appeased Nazi Germany prior to the outbreak of World War II. Germany's uh, Deutsche Telekom is working on plans to establish a, an entirely German-owned Internet system in order to bypass the American NSA. The system would be called Internets. And the idea may spread across all of the European continent. Hey, let's take a uh, break, and uh, I'll be back in a minute. Raymond Ibrahim will join me when I return to talk about the Egyptian charges filed at the International Criminal Court against Barack Obama and his half-brother Malik regarding their support of the Muslim Brotherhood's violent takeover of Egypt. You're listening to True News. Reporting the countdown to the second coming of Jesus Christ, you're listening to True News, the End Time Newscast. This is Max McLean. How will we know when the Messiah comes? Listen to the Bible from Isaiah 9. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. From Isaiah 9, listen to the Bible. It's great for the soul. To hear more, go to radiobible.org. You're listening to True News, your alternative source for global news, analysis, and commentary. I'm Rick Wiles. As I mentioned several days ago, a team of Egyptian lawyers filed charges in the International Criminal Court against Barack Obama and his half-brother Malik Obama. Both men have been charged with crimes against humanity in connection to their involvement and support of the Muslim Brotherhood's revolution in Egypt and its resulting reign of bloodshed and terror. The man who broke the story in the West is on the telephone. Raymond Ibrahim is the author of Crucified Again, Exposing Islam's New War on Christians. His website is RaymondIbrahim.com. Raymond, welcome to True News. Hello, Ray. Good to be with you. Yes, sir. Um, Raymond, I, uh, you know, I, I... before I read um, your website a few days ago and and uh, learned about these criminal charges, I, a person said to me um, last week, uh, asked me, did, did, "Rick, did you do you know about do you know about the criminal charges against Barack Obama?" And I said, "No." I said, "What are you talking about?" And this person has uh, a relative in Europe. And this uh, this individual said, um, I was told that it's it's on European television, that criminal charges have been filed against Barack Obama. 
And so it was one of those things where I heard the information and I thought, wait, I got to look into this. And then it was several days later, I, I came across your website and I, I knew, okay, this is what they're talking about. Um, when were these criminal charges filed in the International Criminal Court? Well, actually, according to the Arabic newspaper that I read, and I got this information from it, it's a very reputable, well-known newspaper in Egypt. It's called um, El Watan News, and it's you know on Alexa, it's ranked like number 10 or something in mm-hmm, Egypt. So mm-hmm. really, billions of copies are sold. I think it actually came out, I don't have it on me right now, but I think it came out in April uh, that this news came out, that it was being filed and so forth, which, of course, is... I think what you're alluding to is an indicator of just how woefully misinformed Americans are, thanks to the mainstream media. Uh, I mean, in other words, I broke this months later, and it wasn't even mentioned for all this time uh, here in the West, or in the United States at least. And it's just uh, kind of uh, a sad reminder how people are kept in the dark, I think intentionally. And I say this uh, based on the fact that I do habitually, of course, get my information from Arabic media and the sort of news that is regularly emanating from the Arab world that is very much uh, would put this administration in a negative light and other matters is it's just regularly uh, ignored, suppressed, uh, just never brought to light. And so the net result is so many Americans are completely misinformed about the reality. Uh, Raymond, I think the last time you were on the program, we were talking about the, the son of a prominent Egyptian who was in prison, and the son said his father had evidence that would put Barack Obama in prison in the United States. Uh, right, I believe that um, I believe that Al Shatar, uh, one of the, the deputy leader of the Muslim Brotherhood organization, who is held in prison with Mercy and the rest of the gang. Mm-hmm. And uh, yes, he did say that the grandson or the son. And, uh, in fact, I just read something else about some other relative of some Brotherhood leader who's in jail threatening, saying that if the U.S. doesn't come, you know, doesn't in- intervene, as it already has, as we've seen with John McCain and Patterson, Lindsey Graham, and all these people who uh, very vocally told the Egyptian people, not I won't even say the Egyptian military, but the Egyptian people to release uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, who are being held for literally inciting terror and murder, Uh, and we have this on videotape, and that's why they're being held and being charged. And here you have the the U.S. intervening on their behalf to get them out. And and, uh, speaking of this Al-Shatar fellow, uh, it was funny because I read again about how John McCain actually went and visited this this man in prison, even though this man is technically or wasn't on the Morsi cabinet. He's just purely a Muslim Brotherhood member. So why... Is John McCain going to visit uh, a, non, a, 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 a non-governmental person in Egypt who's just a top Muslim Brotherhood leader? And once again, it connects the dots about the tight relationship between the United States government and the Muslim Brotherhood. And of course, going back to your point, this is why I believe, and a lot of people in Egypt especially believe, the U.S. is very eagerly trying to get uh, the Muslim Brotherhood out of prison and trying to get them not to be tried because they are fearful that a lot of ugly... <clears throat> Dirty laundry is going to be aired uh, above and beyond what we're talking. Well, I I can tell you this. The the reason John McCain visited a Muslim Brotherhood official in prison in Egypt is the same reason he visited uh, al-Qaeda terrorists in Syria. Uh, McCain is involved in, in covert criminal activities. Do you have do you have any clues what this man was referring to as evidence that could put Obama in prison? No, he was intentionally cryptic. Uh, He was basically saying, you know, the U.S. better act, better intervene, and better do something about getting my, you know, my father tried. Otherwise, we're going to, you know, he'll spill the beans on you guys. So it's cryptic. One can't, you know, really say if there's anything factual or not. But as you just pointed out, you know, we know that the, you know, the U.S. government top figures in it are habitually in cahoots with not just Islamists, not just the Muslim Brotherhood, but al-Qaeda and terrorists, uh, including, in, for example, in Syria. And the John McCain's a perfect example. And now, you know, more information is coming out. Uh, I just translated a video yesterday where Ayman Zawahri, 
uh, the Al-Qaeda leader, who was a former Muslim Brotherhood leader, not only does he point out and that Osama bin Laden himself is a former Muslim Brotherhood leader, but he says in the video that the Brotherhood was supporting the jihad in Afghanistan uh, materially, um, back in the 80s, you know, this supposedly orga- Islamist organization that has disavowed violence and so forth was doing that. And so, you know, all you have to do is connect the dots. And- Are you talking about the organization that Malik Obama uh, directs out of Sudan? Well, I'm talking about the Muslim Brotherhood, oh. just the international organization. Oh, okay, you're so, referring to the Muslim yeah. Brotherhood. Okay. Right, right. Um, Raymond, going back to this, this, uh, these criminal charges filed in the International Criminal Court, um, who filed the charges and what do they allege? Well, um, I don't have the names on me. I can actually pull them up. It's just a bunch of lawyers. Um, I can actually, I'll put her up. I'm, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm not buying my computer. Are these, are these, re- are these reputable people in Egypt? They are Egyptian lawyers. Um, I'm looking at it right here. Um, Dr. Nabil Mithat Salim, uh, who's a, a professor of law, and uh, he did this on behalf of the uh, um, uh, the Egyptian Bar Association of Lawyers. Okay, so, he, so, so he's he's yeah, he's, a, he's a law professor. People. All right, so he's right, a law professor right. in Egypt. Right. Exactly. And they're the alleging creature, crimes against yeah. humanity because uh, they're saying that the Obama brothers were involved uh, in the uh, Muslim Brotherhood takeover of, of Egypt. Well, no. The, the main argument, the crux of it is as follows. The Muslim Brotherhood is guilty. What, what, this, uh, what the complaint does is first it duplicates verbatim what the International Criminal Court holds to be crimes against humanity, and it's a long list, uh, which, I, which I also reproduced on my article. Mm-hmm. So it's things like, uh, you know, mass murder, incitement to murder, um, attacking a specific group of people, torture, extortion, so forth. And then they show how there's uh, at least two well-known incidents, of course not well-known here in the West, because they were rarely reported on, where the Muslim Brotherhood did some of those things to the people, and Egyptians were killed. We have videotapes of Egyptian uh, Muslim Brotherhood leadership saying, inciting terrorism, you know, saying we'll kill anyone who, who tries to oust Morsi or anything like that. And so we have that. So then after showing that the Muslim Brotherhood is guilty of crimes against humanity, the complaint then says by uh, that Obama by, is, an, is basically an access, accessory to the Muslim Brotherhood, one, by providing them with mon- so much billions of monetary aid that the Muslim Brotherhood used to uh, incite terror, because a lot of the people who work on its behalf, the Muslim Brotherhood, and burned you know, up to 85 churches and so forth, are paid. We know that. The people even who vote for the Muslim Brotherhood back in the election with Morsi, lots of them were paid. We have this on record where the, you know, people were just given money to go vote for Morsi. So, it's, uh, so Obama is tied in through monetary aid and, of course, through political aid, as we were indicating how you know, he and, and his you know, top leaders directly intervened uh, threatened Egypt and, in fact, have reduced monetary aid by hundreds of millions, all because of the Muslim Brotherhood. Are they going to be able to f- actually produce a paper trail linking Barack Obama with the Muslim Brotherhood? Well, that's the thing, and that's what you know everyone's waiting for, and and that's what everyone seems to be hinting at, including people involved in the uh, in the Egyptian in- interim government and so forth. And the problem, of course, is everyone was waiting for the Morsi trials and so forth, but they've been postponed. And again, uh, so we have to wait and see what what sort of evidence will come out. And of course, one must assume that the U.S. and Egyptian leadership behind the scenes are discussing the, these trials and what sort of evidence can be allowed to come out and come out in the open. Because, of course, if the sort of evidence there is, is such that we're alluding to, or worse, as, as one hears, then that'll be just a great dilemma for the United States government. So, you know, who knows what's going on behind the scenes and what sort of negotiations are taking place. Uh, Raymond, I've been following very closely the uh, unraveling of the Egyptian American uh, relationship and and the um, the arrival of the Russians in Cairo. Uh, w- what are you seeing and hearing as you monitor Egyptian news sources right now? Well, the two main themes are one: Egyptian popular opinion is very, very pro-Russian, 
uh, and very anti-American popular because of the very reasons we're talking about, because of the very obvious biased uh, support for the Brotherhood, which millions of Egyptians marched against. And, you know, one will recall that you know, during the June 30 revolution, there were placards and signs and people saying, Obama, stop supporting terrorism, stop being a supporter of terrorism in our country. Things, of course, that your average American wasn't even aware was happening uh, um, but yes, definitely there is a, a, a much closer relationship. So I, I alluded to the people, but the government itself, last I heard, is now buying weapons straight from Russia, of course. I think in the, in the U.S. media they were talking about how it might happen, but I just saw a thing that it definitely is already happening. And so there is a, a warming up to, um, and of course, on a personal level, one can see how a conservative society as Egypt would like a person like Putin more. Uh, just because he comes off very, you know, um, you know, he just lays it as it is, a straight shooter type guy, as opposed to someone like Obama, and you get a lot of that in the media where people just idolize him more. He's seen as basically a man, you know, than the whole like a macho type guy, whereas Obama is just another, you know, liberal, doesn't know what he's talking about, and so forth. Um, several weeks ago, the same newspaper uh, that that has reported the the criminal charges against Obama, uh, and I know I'm, I'm mispronouncing it, is uh, El Watan. El Watan, yeah, El Watan. Okay, the nation. They also they also published a story about Muslim Brotherhood operatives inside the U.S. Yes, they did, and I wrote about that, and uh, you know, it's funny because they gave uh, they just named a lot of names and. Uh, after I translated them and I, and I just did it verbatim, and you find that, in fact, a lot of these names are uh, names that people here in the United States and very anti-Islamist organizations have, have pointed fingers at, saying, you know, these people are definitely Muslim Brotherhood operatives. And one of the best, you know, the, the uh, what's on news for gives an excellent example. It, well, the point is that these Brotherhood operatives are working very close around the government to incite the government to not just um, do what it's been doing, which is very pro-brotherhoodish, but actually to try to get Morsi back into power, I mean, let alone getting him out of prison, but to actually get him in power. So it cites a, a, the Hill, an, an article written by one of these men for The Hill, which is really the most widely distributed and possibly most read newspaper on Capitol Hill, which is read by senators and so forth. And the article is just so shamelessly pro-Muslim brotherhood that it's, it actually attacks Obama, for not intervening and how he needs to go in and essentially break Morsi out of prison and put him back in power. And it's just amazing that this could be written in such an influential, politically influential newspaper as The Hill. But, and so it really validates what al was pointing out about how these Brotherhood operatives have their tentacles all around the United States um, pressure points. Uh, just for the benefit of our of our listeners, I, and I really encourage you to go to Raymond's site, RaymondEbrium.com, and, uh, you know, click on the story, Expose Muslim Brotherhood Operatives in the U.S., because uh, he has listed the names and the organizations that were published in this major Egyptian newspaper. Again, this is one of the most widely read newspapers in all of Egypt. This would be similar to the Washington Times or uh, Chicago yep. Tribune. It's a major newspaper. Definitely. And, um, Definitely. and so they've listed uh, a number of of. of of Muslim Brotherhood operatives who are inside the United States of America, uh, the Union of Egyptian Imams of, in North America, the Egyptian American Foundation for Development, a Dr. Khalid Lamada of New York City, Dr. Hassan Al Saya of Virginia, the Egyptian Network in America, um, who else here? Uh, Dr. Khalid Hassan of Maryland, Mohammed Abdel Hakam of Seattle. Uh, Ahmad uh, Shadid of New Jersey, the Egyptian Foundation in Michigan. Uh, there's a Dr. Uh, Hamdi uh, Radwan in North Carolina. And the list goes on and on and on. You need to see, if you're listening to me in, in, in any of these states, uh, New York, Virginia, Maryland, Washington State, Illinois, New Jersey, Indiana, Massachusetts, Texas, uh, Nevada, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, and on and on and on. You can go there and see the Muslim Brotherhood operatives who are in your state. If this is so crucial that the American people realize that Barack Obama is a Muslim Brotherhood jihadist radical. This country is being taken over. And, and 
the vast majority of Americans are absolutely clueless about what's happening. Raymond? It's, um, it's just as you say, Rick, excuse me. Um, <clears throat> what's, what's really amazing, though, you know, I just right now, while, while you were talking, I was looking up um, this newspaper, al Watan. So in Egypt, it's on Alexa. It's ranked in Egypt as 20. And the Washington Post in the U.S. is 74. So what this means is, you know, you got millions of Egyptians who are reading and who are so much better informed about the Muslim Brotherhood threat, not just in Egypt, but in America, than you do Americans. And, and to just top it off, think about this for a moment. Egypt is an Islamic country, and the Muslim Brotherhood was born in Egypt. And Egypt actually kicked out the Muslim Brotherhood and put them in jail. That's how bad the Muslim Brotherhood is, that fellow Muslims from the nation that the Muslim Brotherhood hails from did this to them. And yet here they are in the United States operating unfettered in the White House, in the government, and it just it gets to this point where it's so surreal when you just compare what's going on in the world. Um, we have a few minutes remaining. Tell us about this uh, this uh, uh, lawyer who is persecuting Christians. Right. Um, so <laughs> it's actually a, a, a little amusing. So Mohammed Morsi, the lawyer that apparently was appointed to him, now they're saying he he might not have a lawyer at all because Morsi doesn't even recognize the court. Uh, hearings and so forth, but the lawyer that was supposedly going to represent him, uh, represent him is uh, Mohammed Salim Alawa, and most people don't know this. You see, he, he, he seems like an okay lawyer, but in fact, this is the guy who years back came, went on Al Jazeera, which of course is the most widely watched um, you know, news program around the Islamic world, and started saying that the cops, the Christians of Egypt, in their churches and in their monasteries, were housing tons of weapons that were being sent from Israel so the cops could actually take over Egypt through some kind of reconquista. Uh, and, of course, by doing that, he just, you know, all, all Egypt needs is some incitement, and attacks were, uh, cops were attacked, churches were attacked, monasteries were invaded, and so forth. And yet, here we go, uh, just recently, up to 85 churches were attacked by the Muslim Brotherhood, and one wonders, where were these weapons? How come, if the cops had them, not one instance is there where they were able to use it to defend their monasteries and churches? So it just goes to show you that the guy that supposedly wants to protect Mercy from the charge of inciting terrorism himself is well known for inciting terrorism, especially against the Christian minority. Uh, Raymond, with with the Egyptian army back in control of the country right now, uh, has the level of persecution against Coptic Christians been reduced? Well, it, it, yes and no. It hasn't because the Muslim Brotherhood, of course, is retaliating, and so the attacks on cops has grown. And on the other hand, of course, you have a more moderate uh, military or at least leadership that doesn't want to see this happening simply because it's bad for the country, bad for its image, and so forth, that's trying to, you know, neutralize it. So, uh, long story short, and any cop will tell you this, no matter how bad it's been for them, uh, at least this is better than the potential, especially where the potential was going, which is under the Brotherhood, um, a sort of, uh, you know, extra Islamization of society, uh, a stronger role for Sharia and so forth. Okay, so so the um, the Brotherhood in Egypt, uh, when they want to strike out uh, against the Egyptian so army, they're not going to attack soldiers because because that's far too dangerous. So so they hit uh, the Coptic churches as a way to to uh, punish the Egyptian government. Exactly. They scapegoat the cops because of all of Egypt's segment, uh, segments. They're the infidels, they're the non-Muslims. You know, it's easy to just scapegoat them, attack them, and then use them to you know, try to set the country on fire, you know, give it bad PR, et cetera, et cetera. And this is just, just happens all the time, and this just doesn't even happen in Egypt, but all around the Islamic world. Okay. Well, my guest, uh, Mr. Raymond Ibrium, and his website, RaymondIbrium.com, the book is Crucified Again, Exposing Islam's New War on Christians. Thank you, Raymond. Appreciate you coming by today. Happy to talk to you, Rick. Anytime. You're listening to True News, the end time newscast. Rick will return after this announcement. Christian parents need to hold true to their convictions. Here's today's moment with Charles Stanley. Now, most people today do not have unwavering convictions. They live by one of two methods, either by preference, 
What do I prefer in this situation, this circumstance, which is best for me, easiest for me, the most profitable to me, and will get me the most uh, acclaim or the most acceptance? Or by conviction, basic beliefs held so strongly that nothing you say or do will cause me to say yes or no when I should be firm in what I believe. A conviction, a strong conviction is a personal belief that you hold based on the truth of God's word. It is absolutely essential if you're going to live a godly life, absolutely essential if our children are going to survive in this society, that we teach them basic convictions. Listen, first of all, we must teach them what God says. And secondly, we must live it out. They must watch us live it out. They must hear our conversation as such that we are holding true to our conviction. This is True News. We report the countdown to the second coming of Jesus Christ. I'm Rick Wiles. True News is a listener-supported international radio newscast, and I want to invite you to visit our website, truenews.com. Now, for the past 17 months, I have personally attended a a spirit-filled Anglican church here in Vero Beach, Florida, and it's a member of the... um, Anglican Church of North America, and that's the group of traditional Anglican congregations in the U.S. that separated from the apostate Anglicans that embraced same-sex marriage and uh, homosexual bishops and all that kind of stuff. And I was really impressed by the the dedication of this congregation to to stand their ground and say, we're not going to compromise the gospel, we're not going to go the way of other congregations. And uh, we are going to hold the line. And uh, as I told you uh, a couple of weeks ago, they were uh, just recently in, in Nairobi, uh, 331 bishops from 40 countries gathered. And they sent word to the Archbishop of Canterbury, um, you, you guys uh, approve same-sex marriage, you've crossed the line. That's it. It's, that's, this is the red line for us. We're going to go our separate way. And, you know, I believe the Lord took me to, to that Anglican church to, to show me that, that it's, uh, it's wrong to, to, you know, for us as uh, evangelical Christians to drive by a church that we see the name of an old line denomination and we just automatically judge and say, oh, they, they probably are apostate. They're probably uh, dead cold, you know, and you know the Lord showed me. No, this is a vibrant, spirit-filled congregation of traditional Anglicans, and so He did a work in me. And so, uh, you know, I thought it was going to be a one-time visit, and it turned out I've been there for seventeen months. And the the other thing that was a big surprise to me was uh, um, it's it's a, it's a liturgical church, and and I don't have any any experience or background with a liturgical church. I, I hadn't been in a liturgical church since I was a kid when I attended my grandparents' church uh, in Maryland. And that church was founded in the year 1747. It's the oldest church in the state of Maryland. Uh, when I was a boy, um, I, I know that church was uh, shared by two congregations, the Dutch Reformed and the Lutherans. Now, think about it. It was formed in 1747. Uh, it's apostate now, from what I know. Uh, I'm not going to go there. not going to say anything, but uh, it's, it's not what it was. Well, last year, as I said, uh, the Holy Spirit directed me to this Anglican church, and, and, and the liturgical worship style was very different to me. I really didn't know what to make of it. and uh, But I kept going back. But what I have found over time is that God has done a work in me. And I've been a Christian for a long, long time, and and the Lord has done a work in my heart through this style of worship, and it's touched my soul in a way that I really can't explain right now. Why? What happens in a liturgical service that is anointed by the Holy Spirit? And that's the key phrase here, that it's anointed by the Holy Spirit, because if it isn't, it's just dead cold religion. It's just rituals and forms and, and has no life to it. 
Well, I, I recently saw a video on YouTube about a church in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and it captured my attention. And and I I decided to, to invite the, the pastor of that church to come on the program. Yeah, the church is Grace Lutheran Church in Tulsa, and the pastor is uh, Chris Hall. And his uh, his uh, personal website is Christopher Hall, H-A-L-L, ChristopherHall.com. And he's on the phone right now with me. Pastor Hall, welcome to True News. Thank you very much, Rick. It's a pleasure to be here. Yes, sir. If I may make one correction. It's yes, sir. ChristopherDHall.com. Oh, I'm sorry. You're right. That's all right. That's all right. The other site will take you to the Christopher Hall in England. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. All right. It is, it's, yeah. it is Christopher D. Hall. I'm, I need to read my notes much better. Christopher D. Hall. And Hall is H-A-L-L. ChristopherDHall.com. And uh, can I call you Pastor Chris? You can you can that'd be fine. Thanks. Okay, all right. Um, well, you know, uh, you know, I, I found uh, the video. I was just searching and uh, came across this video, and I and I, I watched it, and I there was something very appealing about about what was happening there in your church. And as I was saying in this introduction, um, you know, the Lord has uh, you know He surprised me. You know, I um, I prayed one day. My wife was uh, away out of town, and I I was alone, and I I prayed. And I said, Lord, where do you want me to go to church? Uh, uh, you know, this this Sunday, and and He led me to this uh, this Anglican church. I didn't even know it was Anglican. So I walked in the door, and you know, there's a liturgical service going on. I had no idea what was happening. Um, it was so foreign to me, but I kept going back, Pastor, and and. And it started. It started to make sense to me. I, st- I started to see the beauty. I started to see the reverence. Uh, I, I, you know, like, hey, everything that they're saying here is biblical. Uh, they're, they're quoting scripture. They're they're doing things that are actually biblical. What am I supposed to do with this? You know. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, right. Well, what about one of the, yeah. yeah go, ahead. go ahead. No. Well, uh, so, I, I, have you always have you always been a, a Lutheran? Have you always been involved in a liturgical church? Uh, for the most part, yeah. Okay. Um, I grew up. I grew up Lutheran, um, and we, I was fortunate that that I had a, a congregation that uh, had a. A wonderful organist, um, a, a treasure that that as a little kid I, I recognized that he was really good, but that's that's all I knew. I you know he he played really well and I always liked what he played and 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 I recall you know the when I I, I don't recall the moment, you know, but um, but I always kind of knew what was going on in church and. And sometimes, you know, when I learned to read, I recall, I do recall opening up the, the hymnal and finding one of the songs that we were singing and, and totally getting lost and realized I knew all the words and I knew how to sing it, and I, but, I, but I couldn't find it on the page and, and what page I was supposed to be on. And, uh, and so I grew up, you know, uh, Lutheran, you know, in that respect. And um, in my teenage years, I kind of uh, wandered away from that liturgical worship a little bit um, I, you know, I, I thought that maybe it was old fashioned, and and I liked rock music, and I should find a, a church that that was more along those lines, and uh, was never really satisfied with that. Um, you know, probably because I grew up a stodgy Lutheran. I don't know, <laughs> but um, but the, the the beauty of the the liturgy and the the depth of meaning, um, I had to be taught really. You mm-hmm. know, despite growing up with it. And uh, right about the time I entered seminary, I, you know, realized that there was more to this than, than met the eye, and and uh, opened my mind and was allowed to to start asking questions about okay, why do we do this and what does it mean and and that's when you know I was, for lack of a better word, the Holy Spirit just kind of illumined me and opened my eyes to say, hey, this has been a treasure your entire life, and for whatever reason, you know, I'm you didn't know what it meant, but but here it is. And then, then I embraced it like nothing else. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, I, I have a, a deep interest and fascination with the early church. Mm-hmm. Uh, years ago, when 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 God called me out of um, the work that I was in in Christian television, and I uh, was the Lord separated me and had me start this uh, radio program in 1999. Shortly after that, uh, Pastor, I, I'd. I discovered the the writings of the anti Nicene fathers. Mm-hmm. Now I had been going, I had been a Christian for decades. I didn't know those writings existed. 
I never heard about it, never knew about it. No one ever mentioned it. I had no idea that there were records of the early church going back that far. And and at first I was um, – there was uh, almost some anger in me that I felt like I had been deprived of my <laughs> Christian heritage. And, and, and it was – you know, there was, uh, there was some – uh, some I don't want to say resentment or 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 un, you know it's just it was just kind of like a you know righteous indignation. Hey, why why haven't I been told these things? And so you have so, you have this family that you didn't know about. Exactly, you know? that's just why didn't it. I know about these grandparents? That's right. That's the way I saw it, and and on I started to fall in love with some of these grandparents of the church, mm-hmm. and. Um, you know, and I, I started to, you know, to, to read their writings and understand how deep their faith was and, and what they endured and the persecution that they went through to give us this faith, to hand it down to us, the Apostles' Doctrine. And so that began the learning process. And uh, so I've, I've had that in me for some, yeah, a number of years now, and I was kind of wandering around from church to church, evangelical churches, it's like somebody feed my soul. Somebody touch the, the most inner part of my soul and feed me, touch my, my heart. And, and especially, Pastor, uh, on the Lord's Supper, uh, I always had this reverence for the Lord's Supper. And I was always frustrated that I could never find an evangelical church that that had that type of reverence for the Lord's Supper. And I, and I was very frustrated many times when I'd be in a church service and they would say, oh, you know, today's uh, you know, communion Sunday. And, and it was like bing, bang, boing. And it's like it's over. And I'm like, what was that? What did we just do? This is not right. <laughs> you know? Right, right. Well, and that, you know, that's a, that's a great observation that – that as as a Lutheran, um, you know, I believe what what our Lord says when He says, "This is My body," that in a in a supernatural way that that we cannot understand and and rationally can't make sense of that bread is the body of Christ. You know, Luther said it was in with and under the uh, the bread, you know, the body of Christ is, and likewise, His blood is is in with and under that wine, and and it's truly present, not in a not in a not only for my faith, not only, you know, um, in, a, in a symbolic sense, but, you know, when I open my hand and, and uh, the, you know, the hostess or the bread is placed, you know, in it, I'm holding the baby Jesus, you know, the baby Jesus like Nicodemus did in, in Luke chapter 2. And, um, and so, uh, you know, that, that understanding is at the heart of, of you know, liturgical worship. Um, when when you believe that that Christ is present in that you know sacramental sense, that supernatural sense, um, in a, in a way different than He is present everywhere and fills all things, as Scripture you know says, that um, it, it makes the world stop, it makes time stop, and you know we fall on our knees and receive Him who gives Himself for us and for our salvation. That's right. Well, I personally believe that in the real presence of Jesus Christ in the sacraments of, of, of the Lord's Supper, um, when, when Luther – and lately I've, I've, been, I've, I've been on this learning binge about Martin Luther, and I'm, I'm reading a lot of books, and I have the, the, the Concordia and I'm, various volumes that I'm, I'm just devouring of Martin Luther right now and, and just revisiting – uh, that man and and what he stood for and his his grasp of the gospel, but when he when Martin Luther said that that Christ is in and under the blood and the uh, uh, under the wine and the bread in communion, what did he mean by that? Well, it's um, you know it, it partially in reaction to the the philosophical theories of you know the of Roman Catholicism at the time. That had an under you know, insisted on this, um, you know, kind of a Aristotelian, you know, move. This this theory of, of that they got from Aristotle that somehow, 
you know, that the, they had to explain what happened to the substance of the bread, the molecules of bread, and, and where, the say, you know, to put it crudely, the molecules of Jesus would come in. And, uh, and so he was reacting against that, saying, well, Scripture, you know, is our, is our only norm for faith. You know, our only, you know when, when it comes to these questions about theology, we only can say what Scripture says. And, and we, you know, if, if it's speculation, we have to call it speculation. And so he says, Scripture, you know, pointed out that Scripture says, this is my body. He doesn't give a, a, a philosophical theory on, on how that happens. Uh, St. Paul says, you know, is the bread that we eat not a participation in the body of Christ? And he says there, you know, you've got bread and body together. And then also he was reacting against some of the, the more radical reformers um, who wanted to emphasize, oh, this is a symbol, this is only a symbolic meal. And, and again, he says, no, Jesus says otherwise, but we can't. We can't really find it any further than that, and, and the only way, I guess, in his language that he could come up with was that it's, you know, in the, you know, the body of Christ is in the bread, it's with the bread, it's under the bread, and we receive it. Mm-hmm. We receive the body of Christ with that bread. The, the Orthodox Christians say it's the mystery of the faith. That right. You yeah. can't explain it. Right. That, that's, a, that's a Lutheran idea, too. <laughs> mm-hmm. We talk about paradoxes in Lutheranism, and that's, uh, mm-hmm. you know. Now, um, just for the record, uh, I, I want you to explain that, that Martin Luther did not teach and believe that, that Christ was being sacrificed again. Well, that's right. That's right. Um, you know, the, uh, the language of the, the sacrifice of the Mass was... Uh, very prevalent in that in those prayers before communion that the priest was had been given a uh, the uh, the ability the character to present this you know body and blood up to god as as the pure sacrifice and and yet scripture says that this was one sacrifice you know um for all and that it has taken place on the cross and and the victories in the resurrection and so uh, luther taught that this the sacrament goes the other direction, not the priest in, in presenting it to God, but really it is God coming to us and giving us the body of Christ and, and putting his blood upon us mm-hmm. so that we may be forgiven. So it's a, it's a top-down, it's a from-God-to-us direction. And, uh, and, that's, and that's the way our salvation works. You know, God, God you know, gives us faith and gives us forgiveness, and our response is is uh, faith and thankfulness and praise to him. Mm-hmm. And his word w- was, this is my body, this is my blood, and is means is. It, right. Yeah, famously, is means is. Yeah, I, I, I hate quoting yeah. Bill Clinton, you know, it depends what the well, definition of that, is yeah. is, but, <laughs> right. but uh, I mean, is means is. And it if he says, true. this is my body, then I, as a Christian, by faith, I say this is his body. That's that's correct. Yes, yes. And it's you not know, it's Jesus. not my job to figure out how it is. I'm just believing right. by faith. Is is that right. is that what Luther taught? That that you sound like a Lutheran, Rick. Oh no. <laughs> What's happening to me here? Huh? What's happening? Yeah, no. <laughs> so. But but that's yeah, that we uh, you know, our, the Lord's ways are not our ways and uh we submit to his word. Mhm. And uh you know, the other pillar of the reformation that the word of you know God is truly the word of God who does and his word does what it says. You know, and I guess that's the other mm-hmm. aspect of, of why our worship is, is liturgical as Lutherans, you know, um, is that that the so much of the liturgy, you know, is just direct quotes from scripture or or you know, paraphrases of scripture and and, and other places. And and we believe that we, that word of God is not just information about God, it's not just information God wants us to know. But it truly is an encounter with him, that he, when, when that word is spoken and proclaimed and heard and meditated upon and read, you know, that, that you're meeting God, that, that Christ is speaking directly to you. And it's not just, you know, totally 100% correct words, but it, it is that, but it is more than that. And so we honor those words of God, um, you know, not worshiping the, the Bible, but worshiping the one who speaks, you know, in the Bible. Pastor, when we receive the sacrament of the Holy Communion and we eat the bread and drink the wine as the bread, as the uh, body and blood of Jesus Christ, 
What is happening to us as Christians during that process? That is a, that is a wonderful question. Um, what is happening to us is that we're receiving, you know, we're receiving the one who was nailed to the cross. Mm-hmm. That his sacrifice and his righteousness are become part of us, you know, that, and that we are being united with him, you know, by the, the work of the Holy Spirit as well, and, and are made his one body. Mm-hmm. And so that his, his life is, is our life, and his righteousness is our righteousness, his perfection is, is credited to us, and, and uh, you know, we're, we're fed in the, the most spiritual, the, the deepest, the most human way. You know, that that is the bread of life, which is given for us. The the other thing that most liturgical churches uh, practice is the confession of sins and the absolution by the bishop. Now, we're not, mm. talk, we're not talking about a confess, confessional box and people going to a private confession. We're talking about the congregation confessing their sins to God. Mm-hmm. Not to the bishop, not to the priest, not to the pastor, but they're confessing their sins to God. And then the bishop or the pastor uh, absolving the sins according to Scripture. Again, uh, I've never been in a church where that was done. This was new to me. <laughs> but that practice plus the communion, receiving the, the body and the blood of Christ together, what I've noticed over these uh, 15, 17 months is that very quietly the Lord has has uh, done something inside me where I have I'm aware that things that have troubled me have gripped me have th- th- things that have deep in my spirit in my soul that I could never shake off and all my mm-hmm. life as a Christian they just melted away. Praise God. And I, I attribute it, Pastor Chris, to, to what's taking place in that service. That there's Absolutely. a spiritual power taking place that I can't see, I can't touch. Something's happening. Absolutely, that's the that's the Holy Spirit working through that Word of God, and uh, you know, and, and nothing else than that. You know, our our services begin the same way. You know, with a, a it's called the General Confession, and uh, that we all say, me included. And then um, I turn to the congregation and, and pronounce those words of absolution. Not, you know, not my my own authority. It's not just Chris up standing up there, but I say, you know, that um, God has forgiven their sins and as a called and ordained servant of Christ, and in His stead and by His command, uh, you know, which refers to to that passage in John twenty, where with the apostles there in the upper room, He breathes on them with His Holy Spirit and says, "Receive the Holy Spirit and." If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. And if you withhold them, they are withheld. And, and this was, you know, uh, the, the most blessed gift in a sense that, that he's given to human beings, that, that we can take that, that divine absolution, that divine, you know, uh, cleansing, and, and find it every single week. <laughs> and, and not based on human authority, but, but Christ doing that and using me as a tool. And I, and I say that to the congregation, and, and I mean it for myself as well, and I know it applies to me as a person. Mm-hmm. And, and it is a beautiful, it is a beautiful gift that, that our Lord has given us in that. Yes, it is. And these gifts have been, they've been lost in, in the evangelical churches in, in recent times. Mm-hmm. And, and I, think, I think the Holy Spirit is, is uncovering them. And and leading people back to the ancient ways of the early church. I, uh, yeah, we've uh, you know I've I've seen that seen that time and time again here um, you know at Grace Lutheran Church and and in you know other places I've ministered is that you know people come in and and they say that they have been looking for reverence they've been looking for you know meaning and um, to get off that Christian rat race of, of emotionalism and, and entertainment, and they found in, in the liturgy um, and in that, you know, the, the gospel and in Christ at work, mm-hmm. and the Holy Spirit there present. Mm-hmm. 
I uh, my my grandson, uh, my grandchildren who who live in Ecuador now with uh, my daughter and son-in-law, they have have an orphanage in in Ecuador. But they were here visiting us for three weeks, and I took my oldest grandson Blake to church with me last Sunday. And uh, you know, when we left, uh, I said, "Well, what did you think, Blake?" And and you know, it was his first time in a liturgical church, and he said, "He said, Grandpa, it was." He said, "A very." I, 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 it was, he said, very, I think he used the word reverent. He said, I, I really felt there was holiness here. Wow. And he said, but I was surprised by the flat screens. <laughs> you know, so, you know, because they had you know, the video screens. But he said, he said, I felt there was holiness here. And wow. I thought, you know, wow. to come out of a 15 year old, uh, yep. yes, he noticed something. There was something that present that he had not felt before. Right. How many how many people in your congregation in Tulsa uh, have a liturgical background, and how many of them are like this is all new to them? You know, it's tough to say. Um, I'm I'm a fairly new pastor here, and still getting to know the congregation. Um, and in my brief experience here, the the members that have come in in the last year and a half, I would say it's about split fifty fifty between those who have experience with it and and those who don't. It's it's funny that, and. And even even the ones that would characterize themselves as having you know little to no experience, a lot of them are old enough to remember the way things used to be, and and some of their you know churches back mm-hmm. in the day, mm-hmm. and and the reverence that just really seems to be lacking, and and tying in with that that statement by your by your grandson, you know, it, it he I'm sure he recognized that holiness because you can't find it anywhere else. That's right. And there's nowhere else in this world. It's uh, that many of these churches are just so empty. It's just noise. It's just entertainment. Mm-hmm. Uh, do, do you have a processional at the beginning of your church service? We do. We do every Sunday. We have a processional, and and the the cross with the the, the body of Christ, the crucifix, you know, comes in and and leads the procession, and and everyone turns to face you know that, and and then we have a recessional at the end mm-hmm. where the the cross is goes to the back and we all process out at that time as well it's it was so refreshing to me to hear the old hymns again mm, yeah i mean you know i you know i tell people who uh i said you know the same way with the lutheran church you know i, I tell them look you know the these anglicans their their hymn book you know goes back 500 years you're going to hear oh, some songs oh, yeah. there that we we haven't heard well right. past- and even further than that you know we have we have one that we sing uh fairly frequently that that's dated to i think 450 AD you know the the text is the the tune's a little bit newer than that <laughs> 450 AD yeah, and you're sure, singing sure. it Oh, it's awesome. It's awesome. Pastor, we're out of time. My uh, my guest today, Pastor Chris Hall, and he is the senior pastor of Grace Lutheran Church, Tulsa, Oklahoma. If if any of our listeners want to visit, where can they find the church on the website? On the it internet? is at glctulsa.org, as in Grace Lutheran Church, Tulsa, glctulsa.org. All right. Thank you so much. Good talking to you, Pastor. Thank you. Good to talk to you, Rick. Well, regardless of your denominational background and theology, I hope you were blessed by my conversation with Pastor Hall about the mystery of the Holy Communion at the Lord's table. Jesus Christ is the bread of life. He said, who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. When you approach the Lord's table with reverence, Jesus will be revealed to you in the breaking of bread. I encourage you to read Luke 24. Now behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. This is after the res- after the crucifixion. So it was while they conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near, near and went to, with them. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. And then later, we see, it says that in verse 30, Now it came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, that he took bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to them. And their eyes were open, and they knew him. My friend, Jesus will be revealed at his table. 